Hej och välkomna till Erik Penser Bank och Bolagsdagen 2020. Mitt namn är Claes Palin och jag är Life Science Analytiker här. Vi har en fullspäckad dag i detta rum. Men först ut i detta rum blir Pled Pharma. Och här för att presentera bolaget har vi vd Niklas Westerholm. Välkommen hit. Du kommer göra presentationen på engelska. Välkommen Niklas. Thank you very much, Klaus, and, and a pleasure being here today at Penser Bolagsdagen. As Klaus mentioned, my name is Niklas Westerholm, and I'm the CEO of Pled Pharma since June 2017. For those who are not that familiar to the company, we are a, a small, late-stage development pharmaceutical company based in Stockholm. Uh, we're traded at the main list Nasdaq here in Stockholm as well. Uh, and we are clearly very much niching ourselves into late stage development of drugs bringing to the market. We're not into the, the, the research space and we're not into the commercialization space as of now. Our current focus is our two assets in the clinical development space. Uh, the first one is Pledox for the prevention of chemo induced peripheral neuropathy. It's a first-in-class asset, and there we have a an, an global phase three program up and running. But it's under wind down, and I'll share a bit more about that due to some setbacks we suffered in, in quarter one. Our second asset is, is Aladot for the prevention of acute liver injury caused by paracetamol overdose. There we are in the midst of planning uh, a pivotal trial, a phase two slash phase three trial, subject to, to some sp study specific details that needs to be verified with, with EMA and FDA now during the summer with subsequent initiation of the study. So that's a short overview of the company today. What I will cover during my, my presentation is, is a reminder of, of the year to date performance and especially calling out which we are very transparent about some of the setbacks we, we have suffered are then going to focus more on how do we see the company today and what will the future look like and the priorities. And furthermore, go, go into the two specific assets I was referring to, Pledox and Aladot. So with that in mind, what we can see here on the screen is, is a summary of, of, our, uh, of the events year to date. Uh, on in January, we communicated that after interactions with the regulatory authorities, the EMA and the FDA, we have landed the development program for Aladot and subsequent market authorization application. That will consist of one pivotal study, a phase two, phase three study, that we are under, the under finalization when it comes to specific study details. More important, I will say, that I can call your attention to is, is around Pledox. So, so we had a number of important events that, that translated to the current situation. First, on the 23rd of January, we, we communicated a clinical hold issued by, by the US FDA. That was in relation to concerns of a handful of CNS-related adverse events. Uh, here, let me remind you, the company positions remain that these adverse events are not related to Pledox as a drug, uh, which is supported by the Independent Data Safety Monitoring Committee, as well as external ex experts that have reviewed these cases. Furthermore, uh, on the 1st of March, uh, the French regulatory authority had the same concern and, and also issued a clinical hold in, in France, which then led the company to take the decision to stop dosing and further recruitment of patients in the Polar program. Subsequent to that, on the 6th of April, we communicated that we are going to close the Polar program. And this was driven by a recommendation by the Independent Data Safety Monitoring Board based on a few number of allergic reactions seen in the patient population that we are studying. However, here is very, very important. The, the, study are the studies are still open. We are collecting data from the patients already enrolled in the program and expecting a data cutoff in during quarter three with a subsequent phase three data readout uh, with focus on efficacy and safety. 
So that's a short summary of the, of the events year to date. If we then move on to based on these events, how do we see the company today? Well, I first I must stress that we still see that Aladot is an utterly important opportunity for us. It's an opportunity to address the substantial unmet medical need in patients arriving to the hospital suffering or, or at risk for, for acute liver injury caused by paracetamol poisoning. Here we have an orphan drug designation in the US. The focus from a company perspective is to actually concentrate on the forthcoming regulatory interactions landing the study specific design for the upcoming pivotal trial. I think it's worth to stress here when it comes to, to the concern around allergic reactions that we haven't seen any severe allergic reactions reported after a single dose administration in the polar program nor in previous studies with Kalmanga for the P. So I think that's worth recognizing when it comes to, to the future of Aladot. When it comes to Pledox then, as I mentioned, uh, we are winding down the program and we are collecting data as of now with the 590 patients out of 700 already enrolled in the program. Here we're looking at the data cutoff time at some point in quarter three with a subsequent readout. Based on the number of patients already enrolled, we e expect to have thorough data to evaluate both from an efficacy standpoint, but also a safety standpoint. Last but not least, worthwhile mentioning as we communicated based on on our quarter one results, we have a robust cash position at hand where we communicated 225 uh, million Swedish kronos at the end of quarter one. And we have already communicated that that, uh, that uh, will, will be enough to at least cover our operations with regards to Pledox and Aladot to end of 2021. So with that, let's move into Aladot and focus a bit more on, on our ambitions there. And as I mentioned, Aladot is, is studied for the prevention of, uh, of acute liver injury caused by paracetamol overdose. The ambition here is to become the new standard of care for the patients that have increased risk for liver injury. Uh, and we are, are focusing on the increased risk based on a couple of reasons. Today, we already have a drug on the market in this space. It's called acetylcysteine or NAC which is a good drug, it's been on the market since the 70s, and it caters for the majority of the patient population suffering for, for, for par from paracetamol poisoning. However, 25% of these patients have an increased risk, and that's determined by they arrive late to the hospital. And late, the definition of late is more than eight hours post overdose, where it's a dis different mechanism that addresses the metabolites that is driven by paracetamol poisoning. So here we are looking at Aladot on top of or in combination with acetylcysteine. Worthwhile mentioning is that we have orphan drug designation in the US in this setting and, and also now after Brexit we are eligible for orphan drug designation in the European Union as well. When it comes to incidents, because I think it's important to calibrate the, the opportunity here and the, the unmet medical need. Here we try to illustrate the, the incidence uh, levels in EU5, but also in the US. And as you can see here, the, the incidence levels are, are substantial. We have around 105,000 people that came into the hospital in the, in the UK alone during 2018 for this condition. 50% of those were hospitalized which is pretty common across the world, that roughly 50% of the people arriving to the emergency room are being hospitalized in this patient population. And we also see around 90,000 from an incidence levels perspective in, in the US. I think it's also, when it comes to the unmet medical need, important to call out that uh, the incidence levels in the US especially is, is rising. Uh, and that's driven by, by the lesser use of opioids for pain management due to some of the turbulence on that market over the last couple of, of years. So I think th th these are substantial numbers, of course, and I think the important thing to recognize here that a number of these patients, uh, a couple of percentage though, not more, are, are having such a severe liver injury that translates into acute liver failure that they are eligible for, for liver transplantation, 
which of course is a burden for the society and of course very, very unpleasant. And that also translates into death. So that is of course also another point which is important from an unmet medical need perspective. I mentioned burden on society, and I think this is a very important thing to, to recognize. I think when it comes to, to cost avoidance and, and the cost from the society's perspective, here are some interesting numbers from the US alone, where in 2010 the cost or the burden for the society for these patients was close to 1 billion US dollars, driven by, of course, hospital stay, liver transplantation, etc., etc. So, when it comes to, to Aladot uh, and the clinical part of the story, so where are we now? So, as many of you know, we, we published the results from our first human clinical trial back in 2018, but also in the beginning of 2019, which were very, very positive. Um, this was a study carried out in 24 patients, which was a randomized study looking at Aladot together with NAC versus Aladot alone in different dosing cohorts. Of course, since this was the first human clinical trial, the focus and primary endpoint was on safety and tolerability, which was met. But more important and very exciting is that the results indicate that Aladot may have an effect on preventing liver injury on a number of different parameters such as um, ALT, keratin-18, uh, microRNA-122, etc. Uh, so that was very exciting, and I think that that also generated a significant interest in the medical and scientific community. So on the right here on the screen, you can see that the results was public published in Lancet eBiomedicine during the summer last year but also was recognized uh, as one of the highlights during the annual liver conference in Vienna in April 2019. When it comes to the next study then, uh, I mentioned that we landed the development strategy after interactions with, with the European a uh, Agency and the FDA. Uh, we look at the, the, the future, future study as such. It's a pivotal trial that consists of a phase two part and also a phase three part, where we, we're actually looking at Aladot with high dose, Aladot low dose on top of NAC versus placebo uh, on top of NAC. Here we're looking at, at so in three arms in total, if we're gonna study the increased risk paracetamol overdose patients, i.e. the ones that arrive to the hospital eight hours after overdose, we will have an interim analysis uh, that way we're going to look at futility, but also having a dose selection and carry on with the most, most uh, efficient dose. Important to recognize that these are tentative study-specific details. We are planning interactions with both EMA and FDA now during the summer to land some of the sp study-specific components. Uh, and to summarize the timelines then, based on this, what we see here today on the screen is, is some of the story uh, that have happened in the past when it comes to progression of, of Aladot, which are, we are very pleased with. We are now in 2020 planning, with the planning for the regulatory interactions and the initiation of the pivotal trial. Here, of course, when it comes to fu the future, uh, potential regulatory submissions and potential launch, that, that's very much of course pending on, on data and positive data, but also more important, recognizing that it's a question mark on initiation of this study, considering the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic times we're, we're in. If I then switch gear and look at the, how do we see the commercial opportunity, rather than providing peak year sales graphs, what I try to do here is calibrate some of the assumptions we look at ourselves when it comes to, to our net present value and the commercial opportunity. Uh, and based on the pricing and, and market research we have done, we see here that we have roughly 135,000 hospital admissions. Uh, of par paracetamol overdose patients in US and, and EU5 per year. We also see uh, a price assumption based on, on some of the interactions we have had with, with payers, key opinion leaders, but also prescribers at roughly $5,000 per patient in the US. 
This will, of course, vary based on the healthcare economic data we are planning to collect during the, the pivotal trial, where a main driver is, is hospital bed reductions, so the stay in the hospital for these patients. And then we also have a very low cost of goods for, for our drug care, and we can calibrate that to low single-digit percentage. So that was to summarize the, the Aladot opportunity. If we then switch gear and look at Pledox and the, the Polar program, our global phase three program. And to take a step back there, this program consists of two studies, Polar A, uh, which are patients in the adjuvant setting, and Polar M, which are patients in the metastatic setting. These two studies was initiated towards the back end of 2018 with ambition of randomized 700 patients in total. We had, as communicated in December 2019, recruited, completed recruitment for the Polar A study. And obviously based on the news during the, the first quarter, we haven't completed the recruitment in the Polar M study. However, what we're seeing here that we are now still collecting data from these 590 patients enrolled in the already enrolled in this study and this will enable us to have a robust evaluation of both uh, safety and efficacy that will determine the path forward from PLEDOX and these are of course still phase 3 data I think it's important to, to recognize that Another detail worthwhile calling out, of course, is that out of these 500 patients already enrolled, 420 patients have completed more than six treatment cycles, which is important in the context of both, of course, safety, but, but moreover, efficacy, since that's where we see that both neuropathy are being generated, but also the potential effect of Pledox of, as a drug is, uh, is prevalent as well. So with that, uh, I'll actually come to an end of, of my presentation and, and hand over to Klaus for any potential questions. Thank you very much, Niklas. And uh, I have a couple of questions. And uh, maybe we should take it in the same order that you presented and start uh, uh, with Aladot then. I mean, you have this clinical hold for the substance Kalmanga for the period in the US and in France. Uh, why do you feel confident that this could be, uh, I mean, removed or at least partially removed so you could mm. perform your clinical trials with Aladot? I think it's important to recognize when it comes to the, to the clinical hold in the US and, and uh, by the ANSM, it's a clinical hold for Pledox, i.e. Kalmanga for the peer, for this specific study. So it's for the POLAR program, uh, looking at Pledox for the prevention of chemo-induced peripheral neuropathy in that patient population with that number of doses. So I think if you take a step back, it, we, we talked about two concerns. One was the CNS-related concerns. Our view, our position as a company still remains that these are not related to Pledox as a drug. Uh, we, can't, we can't verify that from, from any any uh, mechanistic perspective nor in the clinical setting that is also supported as I mentioned before by the independent data safety monitoring board that has looked at all the data of course in an unblinded fashion as well as an independent expert so I think that that's one point the second point is I guess when it comes to to the allergic reactions uh, I was referring to before very important there is to, to stress again that we are, with Aladot, studying a different patient population with a different risk category, so to say, and these allergic hypersensitivity reactions hasn't been seen until cycle six and onwards. And as you remember, Klaus, I hope, is that at Aladot is given as a single dose alone. Yeah, but it's also given to, to children, in, in, uh, at least uh, young people, so, I mean, the bar could be quite high still from the regulatory and perspective. Th there you're pointing out a very, very important perspective, and that's something we're also discussing or planning to discuss now during the summer, which is the pediatric plan. Yeah. So what are, if you think about the, pa uh, the, the potential, or the upcoming, sorry, pivotal trial in the Aladot space, what are the threshold from an age perspective, considering not just only allergic reactions, but, uh, but the development in general, and, and how do we split that? So that I can't confirm, but, but we're looking at adults mainly, of course, when we're studying Aladot going forward, initially. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, and uh, when it comes to this uh, pivotal uh, trial, uh, what needs to be in place? Um, I mean, like manufacturing and setting up sites uh, and so on. Where do you stand right now? So I think, uh, yes, it, it's two components to this. Yeah. One, of course, landing the study specific details I was referring to, sample size, uh, primary endpoints, and the threshold of primary endpoints. Of course, we got some guidance already from EMA and the FDA during the interactions in quarter four, but landing the specific th threshold. So I think that is progressing as, as well, of course. In parallel, we are working with a, a CRO selection uh, and identifying through that process, identifying the sites, the number of sites, the sites that are, that are interested in, in participating in this study. Of course, sites that having a lot of patients with this condition. Uh, and th there we are getting very, very good help from our, our principal investigating coordinators in the US and, and James Dare here in, in, in Europe. When it comes to, to CMC, since this is a pivotal trial and, and the sample size won't be that huge and it's given as a one dose only, we are already on track for the manufacturing of the, the clinical material to the study. Mm. Uh, and uh, given the, the situation right now, um, are you considering to, to, um, to some find a partner for this pivotal trial or are you going for this for yourself? I think it, uh, I think you, we have got this question quite a few times, both mm -hmm. from Pledox and, and, and Aladot. I think a company in our, in our size and in, in, in our situation, one should always be active in, in having partnerships. However, that's of course something that we can't control ourselves. We're very much open to discussion with, with the potential partners from a co-development perspective, from a commercialization perspective. There are always discussions in that space and, and I think that's prevalent from, from Pledox and the, the, the very good agreement we have in place with the Japanese company Solacia for the development and commercialization of Pledox in, in the Asia region. So I think that's of course something we always are active in but we can't control it ourselves. So as always the base case is moving forward with Aladot ourselves but of course very active in the partnering space. But also to some extent if you want to partner on board then you need to be quite active perhaps. Of course. Uh, I mean, it's not always they pick up the phone and, and call you. But, but I interpret that you're not uh, really actively pursuing the partnering. Uh, no, I, I would turn it around and say that, that we are always active in that space. Okay. So, so both from, from Pledox, obviously the situation are slightly different now due to, to the concerns we have. Uh, and there one wouldn't expect anything else until we have the data at hand from the phase three trial. When it comes to Aladot, there is always, we are, we're active in the business development space and there are always uh, partner discussions ongoing, of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and just uh, a financing issue, if you want to address that. Uh, current financials, mm -hmm. how far do you get in, in the Aladot trial with current finance? I think what, what, what I said, and this is based on the, the, the current plans we, we have at hand, considering both the activities for Aladot, but also for, for Pledox, yeah. of, of course. We have said that we have cash towards at least end of 2021. We have a robust cash position today with 225 million reported at the, the end of quarter one. I think it's difficult to say that exactly, because it's dependent on, on a few moving parts. One is, of course, the sample size of the mm. upcoming pivotal trial which we haven't uh, for Aladot which we haven't landed yet with authority so that of course will drive cost both up and down depending on, on the base case we have and second of course is when can we initiate the study because we are both fully aware that initiating a study if we talk about here and now today is difficult due to to the COVID-19 and especially in, in, in for Aladot in, in such a space where you're studying actually in the, the emergency room or the in intensive care unit. So I think it's very much pending on those two parameters mainly. Okay, then let's switch to Pledox and, um, and the ongoing trial. Um, and uh, are, you, are you satisfied with the way you are able to collect data from the pa patients currently? Yes, I am actually, and I'm, I'm positively surprised because here, of course, 
not just for Plaid Pharma, but for all companies that, that have, a, have a trial up and running today or a study up and running, it's difficult. It's difficult to gather data. What we have done is we've been very proactively together with our CRO, and this is, of course, based on, on, on guidelines, new guidelines issued from both EMA and the FDA, how to collect data. It, it gives them more flexibility. So we are actually not just relying on hospital visits today, because that's, of course, difficult, but we are also uh, being able to collect data via phone, or et cetera, et cetera. So I think that the data collection and the progress of the same has been very positive so far. And uh, jump to the, the to these uh, adverse events that have been registered in the trial. Uh, I mean, it's quite a few one <laughs> actually. Uh, I mean, yes, if I c are correct, it's four CNS adverse events that's uh, triggered the uh, FDA to stop uh, the um, uh, or put it on a clinical hold. I mean, you're pretty sure that this is not related to Pladox. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit further. Yeah, and and uh, as I mentioned, of course, we have reviewed these cases in depth from, from every angle one can think of, I want to stress. And of course, this has also been reviewed by the Independent Data Safety Monitoring Board, also very, uh, in a very important, obviously independent from the company. And we also, so amongst others, uh, have had external experts in this space looking at these adverse events. So, so a professor in neurology from John, Ho John Hopkins Hospital in, in Baltimore has looked at these. And I think we all, th all three different parts here come to the same conclusion that it's not related to, to Pladox. Have you had any f more interactions with FDA or the French uh, authorities since the clinical hold? No, no, we haven't, and, and it's a simple reason behind that, since we already made, the company has made the decision to stop further dosing and recruitment of any potential patients. Uh, the important thing here is that we will wait, await data. We are generating robust data, as I mentioned, or thorough data, as I mentioned, from 590 patients. We're going to unblind that after the data cut off in quarter three, and based, of course, on how that data would look like, we will have interactions with, with the agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, you also have had this allergic reaction that the DSMB re reacted to. It's a little bit uh, uh, curious situation when they are, are um, uh, really getting uh, stressed with, with these um, mm -hmm. adverse events. I mean. Uh, should we, uh, should we believe that this uh, is uh, more likely to be related to Pladox than the CNS adverse events? And, and here we, we are investigating further, so we're working with, with uh, uh, immunologists in order to try to understand po Pladox's potential role in this. I think it's important here again to stress that oxaliplatin alone, and one can look at the, the USP, I, the label for oxaliplatin in Europe, for example, it clearly calls out that 1 to 2% will, su uh, will suffer from allergic hypersensitivity reactions by oxaliplatin alone. So here we, are, we have to look at, of course, since this has been raised as a concern, we have to look at uh, two things, really, because as I mentioned, we, we don't see this until after cycle 6 and onwards. So first question, why does it happen after cycle six? And, and why does it happen together with, with Kalmanga for the Piran Pledox? So that's mm -hmm. something we, we are investigating. I think it's important to recognize when it comes to these allergic hypersensitivity uh, cases that they have been transient uh, with the standard treatment. Of course, the people have been, been able to leave the hospital, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, of course, they are reported. Some of them are severe uh, adverse events, but they're still transient and, and the pa patients, when they've been discharged from the hospital, has been, been well. Have you had any regulatory agencies raising the flag for these allergic reactions during the trial? I'm just thinking here, because <laughs> obviously you have ongoing, di ongoing dialogues. And I think that the main focus has, has been, obviously, what, what we have communicated externally, the main focus has been on, on uh, from the French authority and from the FDA around uh, the adverse events in the CNS space, rather than anything else. Uh, do you see a, a challenge to perhaps prove that these adverse events are not related to Pladox or... I think it's always a challenge, of course, when, mm -hmm. when, when, when we look at things like this and we ha when you have unexpected adverse events like this. 
Uh, we are working, as I mentioned, with immune oncologists. We are trying to consider what type of preclinical studies we can do in this space to prove that 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 Pledox, of course, is, is not the culprit in, in driving the allergic reactions. So I think one can do quite a lot in order to prove, if we want to use that word, mm -hmm. that, that Pledox is, is or isn't actually driving this. But, but um, yeah, we, we have to further investigate, I would say. Sure. Um, and maybe if you would like to comment on, um, on your partner, Solasia, how, mm. how, how have they reacted to this news? I think that that's one thing I'm, I'm really proud and pleased of that, that our partner Solasia, and I mentioned that before, that was a license agreement we, we signed for Pledox for the development and commercialization in the Asian region. Uh, it was a deal that was uh, worthwhile back then, up to seven, eight hundred million, uh, million Swedish kroners. And on top of that, they are of course paying for, for the patients in the Asian region as part of the Polar program. That collaboration has been fantastic, I must say. We are very much aligned on, on all the decisions. So the decisions you have seen that we have taken throughout the journey, especially in quarter one, we very much aligned on the same. It's a, it's a fantastic collaboration and we're both committed to investigate this further and, and of course very excited about the data we are generating as well and the subsequent readout from this phase three program. Okay, great. And uh, just my final question then is, uh, if you could perhaps be a little bit more specific about the timeline, when we should expect top line data. That I can't, and, and <laughs> I know you're going to ask this question, and of course I, I wish I could answer that. And, and I think that that depends on, on very much on the data collection from now until quarter three, etc. Due to, to the pandemic situation we have at hand, of course we now have a, a bit of a bigger leeway with regards to when to collect data, etc. Considering the situation, so I can't. But what I can say is, it, it's going to be during this autumn. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Niklas. Thank you very much.